So, um, share my screen real quick. Share the screen. There we go. All right, I dropped the um, the website into the, the chat, and if you click on the schedule, I um, just wanted to highlight a couple of things. So um, a couple of weeks ago, the last time we met, Eric gave us a talk about um, his uh, trials and tribulations with tidy data. It's, it's always something you have to invest time in. Eric, if you have a talk or anything you would like to share, if you drop it into the chat, I'll pop it up there. Today, um, we have uh, Hayden on the deck, and he's going to talk to us about a, uh, well, I thought it was an interesting example that other people would be interested in. It's a binomial regression using some data from his very own PhD that um, we've talked about and tried to think about uh, put our heads together on the best way to analyze it. So um, I think the plan is today, you'll tell us, of course, in a moment, Hayden, is that you'll just talk a little bit about the data and we'll just chat about um, uh, getting some feedback for, for the analysis as it is and run through that code. Um, binomial regression is something that is common, but it, it's not easy. Uh, so there's some weird stuff about it. So we can talk about that. I just wanted to highlight the next couple of weeks. Um, this is a little bit, uh, I think it's a little different than what I sent out, but um, I was going to go through MLR, that modeling um, book that I've been reviewing next week, but um, we, uh, I, I just had a second thought about it, and because uh, things have been so hectic for me earlier in the term, I thought I would take a, um, a week, and uh, I had two ideas. One, I want to do a survey about things that um, will be helpful and interesting to people for the next few weeks and get a list of things. We did that about a year ago and it worked out really well. We haven't done it in a long time, so I thought I would do that, get some feedback on what people are interested in. It's been a while since we've done any Python, um, and I know there are some people that are interested in doing some Python stuff. So, you know, think of some topics that you're interested in and we'll take a survey. The other thing that has been on my mind lately, partly precipitated by the stats module last week, is um, uh, a thing that I've thought of for a long time, but it's it's quite hard to, to do because it takes time and it, it takes a lot of thought, and it's personal. And that's making a cheat sheet. So recently I have, um, I decided I was going to, to make a, um, some cheat sheets for, the boot camp, and um, this always opens up a can of worms. And uh, as I was thinking about how the best way to do it, I thought it would be fun if we put our heads together on that. So I have a bit of an activity. The activity will involve reviewing and critiquing some existing cheat sheets, and then trying to come up with uh, attributes that a good template for a cheat sheet would look like. And, and maybe that template could form the basis of um, of uh, you know your personalized cheat sheet for uh, for R or Python to do something or whatever. Now I need some volunteers in coming weeks, um, starting the end of this month. Uh, I have a potential person. I don't know exactly what data Olivia will slide in, but she's done a data analysis involving some behavior data that involves a mixed effects model. It's fairly straightforward. And it, she's in a bit of a situation where she would like some feedback and some um, feedback on the graphs and some of the stats too. So that's what I have planned. Any comments or declarations before I hand it over to Hayden to talk to us about woolly aphids and uh, woolly apple aphids and earwigs? Any comments or declarations? All right, Hayden, I'm going to hand it over to you. Take it away. OK, cool. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, so. Uh, in the beginning, hopefully this is uh, showing up now for everybody and apologies that it's a little bit plain. Um, my name is Hayden Tempest. I'm uh, just started my third year of my PhD and I'm working on woolly apple aphid and earwigs. 
um, I'm an ecologist and entomologist. And um, so while I am a student at Harper Adams, I'm actually based down in Kent at a um, independent research company called NIAB. I'm at NIAB EMR uh, in East Malling. Um, and basically, uh, the data I'm going to be sort of running you guys through today is um, on these two species. So the, the two pictures at the top here are both woolly epilaphid, uh, one with a kind of zoomed out shot and one closer so you can see the actual uh, bodies of the insects. So this is an aphid. It's an important pest of apple trees. It basically sucks on the woody tissue of them uh, and causes uh, galling, which is a bit like a tumor for a plant which interferes in the tree's ability to grow. Uh, so it's a bad pest, people don't like it very much, and it's very expensive to deal with chemically at the moment. Uh, there's really only one insecticide people use for it, and it's pricey. Um, and the species that I'm looking at um, as a sort of biocontrol option for woolly apple aphid is the common European earwig. Um, and these are nocturnal, they're crawling insects, um, and they're uh, generalists and omnivores. So they eat a wide variety of stuff, um, but they seem to be particularly keen on aphids. And there's been kind of mixed results on getting biocontrol to work with them for woolly apple aphid in orchards. Um, so that was what I was working on. And um, basically at the start of my second year during the field season, I decided it would be interesting to try and run a study looking at the sort of efficacy or efficiency of earwigs in controlling woolly apple aphid. Basically, they've got these really mixed results where sometimes they can be present and they seem to control woolly aphid and sometimes not. And I was wondering if I could find maybe some um, variables that would explain why earwigs are sometimes more or less capable of eating woolly apple aphids, stuff like um, are there other aphids that aren't covered in wool, so the earwigs are going for those instead? Um, are in older orchards, are the trees sort of more gnarly and therefore more difficult to search over? Um, and so earwigs find less woolly apple aphid colonies. Um, stuff like that, basically. So what I wanted to do was um, collect a bunch of information on uh, from trees that contained both woolly apple aphid and earwigs, and then um, collect um, other information about the orchards that those trees exist in um, to basically see if I could find a pattern that was leading to this. Um, in terms of, and apologies to everybody, I'll probably be cutting back a little bit back and forth between different doc documents. I hope that's not too annoying. Um, Basically, this is just a look at my raw data in Excel. Basically, I collected quite a lot of information. Uh, you can see a, a lot of different variables. Um, and pretty quickly, what became apparent uh, was that my original plan wasn't going to work. Um, so field data is always messy and complicated. Um, and in this case, the key issue I had was that there were very few um, sites, uh, very few orchards or trees which contained both of the insects that I was interested in. Um, so I have a, sorry, let me first um, share the slide I had for this. So um, uh, basically um, I had these two dependent variables, earwig counts and woolly apple aphid counts. Um, and then I had a larger number. You can see already I've cut out a lot of them that were in that Excel spreadsheet. Um, and we, we won't talk about all of these in depth. But basically, this was how I initially thought about the um, different variables, the different information that I was collecting was my two, uh, the count data on the actual insects involved. And then these kind of independent variables, explanatory factors, um, or I like to think of them as kind of um, labels that I apply to the data points from these as well. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to this idea of labeling data with the different ones um, later on. Uh, so this was this was basically the information I collected. Um, and pretty quickly, 
I realized that I was running into an issue. Um, which was that. Um, if we look at. The average colony counts for woolly apple aphid and then the average trap catch for earwigs. So I was trapping these in little refuse shelters. There were um, very few orchards that had both. So I was getting a lot of zeros. Um, for both species. Um, particularly, you can see some of these conventional orchards. Uh, I simply wasn't finding very many um, woolly apple aphid in them during either survey. Uh, and interestingly, they were the ones that were often containing the most earwigs. Um, so you can see, uh, basically, I wasn't getting enough of an overlap in the distribution of my two study species for me to look at my original question, which was how effective the earwigs were as predators. Um, but I still felt like the information I was gathering um, could be useful. So basically, um, what I decided to do was take the this this information and instead of looking at um, the efficiency of the earwigs in eating woolly apple aphid, um, I decided to ask the the more basic question of um, why are they appearing in the orchards that they're appearing and on the trees that they're appearing on? So why are there earwigs on this tree and not this other tree? Why are there woolly aphid on in this orchard and not this other orchard? Um, because this information can still be used to answer that question. So um, the way I was taught to do this in uh, my undergraduate degree was with a general or generalized linear model. Uh, basically, I could model for one of these two um, uh, variables here and then use the rest of these as effects in my general linear model. That would spit out a nice p-value. I would know whether there was a significant effect on my dependent variable or not. Um, it's not the only method to use. Uh, one of my supervisors mentioned, uh, I think it's called dimensionality reduction or something like that. Um, so there are other methods. This was just the one I would had been taught. Um, and at the time I was rushing to try and get this done for my second year report. So that was what I went with, was something I knew. Um, and I had uh, a first go at this in R and it went uh, quite badly. Um, so you can see the first model I specify here, uh, nine variables, each separated by an asterisk. Um, and this was spitting out an error code. Um, and I'm not, uh, I'm probably far less uh, literate in R uh, and coding and statistics than a lot of you here. So uh, when, when it spits out, when R spits out an error code for me, I'm not always, I take a guess, a stab at what that means, but I'm not always very good at determining um, what's going wrong. In this case, uh, it said that variable lengths differ. I thought, OK, maybe there's um, some NA values uh, from the zeros uh, for some of the variables, some of those uh, sort of metadata on the orchards, if you like, stuff like the productivity from previous years or its age. I didn't necessarily have. Um, so I tried to cut that out. I was still having a problem. Uh, so then I called up Ed. Um, and Ed immediately uh, went, Hayden, you've started uh, doing this backwards. Um, so you've started with nine variables separated by an asterisk, the most complicated model you could think of. That's over 500 possible uh, factors and their interactions. Um, so that's way too much for R to even process on a little laptop like mine. Um, and it's also probably going to spit out a bunch of um, nonsense speaking biologically. Um, so for example, a fourth order interaction. I would have no idea here how to even begin understanding that, let alone interpreting it biologically. Um, so that was the first thing Ed said. Secondly, he said, Hayden, look at your data. Um, you've picked a Poisson model because that's supposed to be for count data. Uh, your count data has too many zeros. It's um, simply not a Poisson distribution. Um, so uh, Ed was very helpful with that. He said, the best the best idea would be to uh, turn this into presence or absence data binomial and then you've still got the zeros but essentially grouping all of this other data into a single column for present uh, for both earwigs and the, this this is for woolly apple aphid but the same thing happens when you plot the earwig numbers that I got as well um, 
So Ed helped me with that. Um, and then he sort of, we were running out of time in, in the meeting that we had and Ed sort of at the last second fires off. Also, uh, clearly you need mixed effect mouse holes. You've got pseudo replication going on. Uh, and then he left and um, I was like, oh no, time to figure something out now. So uh, I was left to uh, kind of learn a little bit about what mixed effect modeling was, what that means. Um, and luckily for me, I found an excellent paper it's by Harrison et al. I assume uh, one of Ed's children's children. Um, and this is an excellent model, um, an excellent paper for mixed effect modeling, specifically with um, ecological data in mind. Um, and if any of you are ever struggling with this, I think this is a really excellent place to start. Um, it basically goes through, it explains uh, what mixed effect modeling is, and it talks about um, random variables and data structure. Um, so basically, the decision of whether to um, model something as a random effect or a fixed effect, here's the section, um, is quite important, especially um, ecologically, random effects can make a lot of sense. So I said that my data had pseudo replication. Um, essentially, I had gone back twice to each of the trees in my study and uh, uh, surveyed the woolly apple aphid and the earwigs on them on those two separate occasions. That data is paired. Um, so it would be uh, pseudo replication to um, consider those as separate data points. I should be grouping the data by tree. Um, and in fact, I should be grouping it by a lot more. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but so just to explain these um, random effects versus fixed effects, in case you guys hadn't heard about them, as I had not. Um, um, when you model something as a uh, random effect, the key thing is that you're considering your um, levels in that factor as um, only a subset of the population's entire number of levels. So for example, in my experiment, I sampled 11 orchards. Um, I didn't sample every apple orchard in the UK. So my um, sample of orchards is only a subsection. Um, and so mm. modeling that as a random effect instead of a fixed effect would probably be a good idea. Um, similarly, I, because of time reasons, I, there's no way I could go through every single tree in each, in all 11 orchards, because um, that would be thousands of trees that I had to survey. Uh, so I, only, I was only surveying 10 trees from each orchard. That's another uh, subset of the entire population of the tree in each of the trees in each orchard. Uh, so that would be another example where a random effect is suitable. Um, so basically this, this um, got me thinking about these random effects, about data structure. Um, and I went back and realized that I needed to think a lot more um, about how my variables were kind of arranged, how I'd collected the inf information. Um, and so this sort of breakdown into two groups is too simplistic. It's not simply that I have these two dependent variables and then a bunch of explanatory factors that are all sort of equal. Um, these different variables are acting on different levels. Um, so I had six growers. Each grower owned a certain number of the orchards in my study. Uh, within each orchard, I then had 10 different trees, and then each tree had been surveyed twice. So I had these four levels in my data, and my explanatory, um, my independent variables or explanatory factors, they could each be assigned to one of these levels to help kind of better understand the data structure. Um, and this tells me a lot about which, um, which effects need to be modeled randomly. Um, so basically all, all four of these levels could be modeled as random factors because um, yeah, my 10 trees were only a subset of all of the trees I could have um, surveyed in each orchard. These 11 orchards were only a subset of all the possible orchards that each of these growers owns, and these growers are only a subset of all of the apple farmers in the UK. Um, the only one that's tricky is the survey. Um, so 
obviously my two survey points, my these times when I went out are not the um, an exhaustive list of all possible times that I could have run the survey. Um, but they're not really appropriate to run as a random factor. Um, partly because uh, it gets very difficult to infer outside of um, the sort of seasons that I surveyed in, but also because I only had two levels. And uh, when modeling random uh, random factors, you should try and have at least five levels to your variables. Um, so based on this, I uh, went back to R, this time armed with a bit more knowledge of what I was doing. Um, and I'm going to show you now some of the more um, some of the better fitted models that I ran. So um, first of all, as a comparison between um, this initial attempt um, at running, you can see there's a bunch of code here that I didn't need to include at all. Uh, basically, um, just not including that leaves it as default, and default was fine. Uh, you can see I've switched uh, my function to binomial because I'm looking at presence or absence data. Um, and I've specified this time, this is very simple, but this is a hierarchical model now. So I'm capturing some of that data structure that I talked about. Basically, my um, trees are nested within the orchards, which are nested within the growers. Um, and this model here, um, these are the results from it, you can see. Um, so this will give me a variance score for each of the different um, random factors. And basically, the higher the variance score, the more important um, it is, because the more variance is explained by that factor. So you can see that in this case, um, there seems to be very little difference between the trees in an orchard, um, quite a lot of difference between um, different orchards owned by the same grower, and an even bigger difference between um, different growers. So this is better, um, but if we go back to that question of why am I finding earwigs in this particular orchard um, and not this other orchard or this particular tree and not this other tree, um, what this model tells me is that um, you have a different you have a different likelihood of finding woolly apple aphid in different orchards because they're different orchards. Um, so basically, it's uh, not telling me very much at all. Um, so the next thing to do was to try and break down um, some of these variables, and basically this means removing them. Um, and going back to some of those other explanatory factors um, to see if they can sort of answer this question, why this orchard and not this orchard? Um, and just as a, a quick aside, um, I've modeled all of these here as um, random intercepts. If I go back to um, Harrison et al for a second, we can see that it's possible to model a random effect as a um, a random intercept, uh, or a random intercept and a random slope, or just a random slope. Um, so while this paper does a great job of explaining what a random versus a fixed effect is, um, for me, I slightly struggled with this. Um, so the way I like to think about this is, um, and Ed can stop me if this is completely wrong, um, if we imagine modeling, um, so I'm looking at the woolly apple aphid, woolly apple aphid data, um, the likelihood of finding woolly apple aphid on a tree, um, and I'm using orchard as a random effect, and then um, farming system, which is basically whether or not the orchard was organic or conventional as a fixed uh, as a fixed factor. Then modeling it as a random intercept, I'm basically saying um, I'm expecting. Um, sorry, and let's. Let's imagine sort of hypothetically, all of my orchards start as conventional and then some of them switch to being organic. And I want to see how does switching to organic affect the likelihood of finding woolly apple aphid. That's, that's not actually how it works, but we can kind of imagine it as a way to interpret the model. 
Um, basically, um, what I would be doing with a random intercept for Orchard is I'm saying my Orchards are all starting with a different likelihood of containing all the apple aphid. Um, but as they switch to organic, the likelihood of finding all the apple aphid in them increases, basically. Um, with a random slope and a random intercept, I'm saying that my um, these these conventional orchards, when they switch to organic, they started off with a different likelihood of containing woolly apple aphid. Um, but the amount that that likelihood changes um, also is different between each orchard. That's um, as they as they become organic. So it has it has a the the size of the effect is different for each um, orchard. That's how I understand it anyway. That's probably a, a huge oversimplification. Um, but if any of you uh, are looking into this and uh, struggle like me, hopefully that helps as a way to think about it. Um, so um, I model these as random intercepts and not as random slopes, um, basically because for a lot of these, I was not I wouldn't expect the size of the effect to vary. So being organic, I'm I'm kind of uh, it's an assumption, but I'm kind of happy with the assumption that um, that the size of that effect would be the same no matter which orchard it is on. They would all increase the likelihood of finding woolly apple aphid to a similar degree. Um, and the other uh, one of the reasons I'm happy with that assumption is because um, random slopes. Um, tend to require much larger sample sizes than random intercepts do, um, and also don't work very well if you have um, different um, uh, different n values, as in different different numbers of observations per group, uh, which is the case for grower as a random uh, factor in my case, in my experiment. So uh, with that as an aside, um, I want to get back to. Uh, so I was talking about how this model essentially says, um, yes, you you have a different likelihood of finding woolly apple aphid in different orchards because the orchards are different. Um, so what I wanted to do uh, next was to try and um, break that down a bit and look at what about the orchards is causing these differences, uh, which means um, basically removing removing grower and orchard as factors from the model, um, and then substituting in some of these other um, explanatory factors into the model in their place. Um, and obviously, you can't include both of them. Um, so, for example, farming system, whether an orchard is organic or conventional, if I label a given tree, so let's say tree 47, if I label this as organic, this um, this basically tells the tells the model that this tree belongs to one of one of three possible organic orchards in my study. Um, if I label the tree as uh, orchard four, that tells uh, the model that the tree belongs to orchard four and that it's organic because all of the trees in Orchard 4 are organic. It's an orchard level factor. So basically, um, Orchard as a random factor um, sort of masks the uh, effect that I would be trying to detect from a bunch of these other variables. And um, so as well as, as, well as telling um, the model that tree 47 is organic because Orchard 4 is organic, it contains a bunch of other information that organic or conventional as a sort of label for that data point, that tree um, is missing, such as um, the elevation of that orchard, um, how much sunlight that orchard tends to get per year, the age of that tree. Um, basically, all of that is sort of contained within the label orchard. And I'm trying to break that apart and look at each of those uh, more individually. Um, so that's what I did, um, and basically I wanted to talk a little bit about a few different models um, and model interpretation. So um, I assume most of you will be familiar with general or generalized linear models to a certain degree, 
um, basically for fixed effects, they spit out these uh, p values, these um, estimates of the effect size here and the standard error. Um, and the uh, these are really helpful. Um, and they also spit out the AIC value. So when you're trying to um, fit models, you generally you're aiming for one with a low AIC value. Um, so if we go to model 20, which was um, this model with the uh, with the data structure um, here. So I have tree nested within orchard nested within grower. You can see we have an AIC of 145. Um, and unsurprisingly, when I take out um, uh, grower and orchard as variables, and again, I have to remove them because they're masking the effects of these other variables that I'm interested in. Uh, unsurprisingly, the AIC shoots up, so the model gets worse at explaining variability in the data because I'm now um, missing a lot of those factors that the that are dif different between orchards, but which I didn't measure. Um, like light levels, microclimate, how far away they are from uh, pristine woodland, for example. Um, so the AIC value is great for interpreting these. You also need to look at the parameter estimates, um, but I wanted to give some examples of how tricky this can be. Um, so if we look at this, I believe is model 25, yeah. So um, model 25, um, I've basically, I've got survey as a fixed factor. So whether or not the likelihood of finding Willie Appalachford changes depending on which, which of the two times I went to visit the orchards, uh, whether or not the orchard is organic or conventional. Um, and then I still need tree as a random factor here um, because otherwise I get that pseudo replication that I talked about earlier. Um, we can see all of these are showing up as um, significant, and I've got an AIC of 168. Um, now, model 26, which is the same except for the fact that I'm adding earwig presence, uh, we can see the AIC value is pretty similar, um, and I'm not getting a um, significant p-value for AWIC presence. And we can see that the uh, the size of the estimate and the error in the estimate are uh, very similar. So uh, this suggests that AWIC presence, whether or not AWICs are in the same tree as the Woolly Appalachian, doesn't seem to have a big effect on the likelihood of finding Woolly Appalachian. Um, however, if we then add a interaction effect between farming system and AWIC presence, uh, now the story changes. So now I'm getting highly significant p-values for both of these. Um, but the AIC value has gotten worse. Um, and basically there are no, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to deciding on what your best mixed effect model is. Uh, you kind of just have to look at them, look at these things, the AIC values, the p-values, the estimates, the standard errors. Um, and you have to think about what they say about your um, biological system and um, whether or not you think it's acceptable to um, make inferences based on them. So in this case, um, I like this model because um, it shows an interesting effect between my uh, biocontrol agent and the thing that it's supposed to be feeding on. So it's biologically relevant to what I'm looking um, at. Uh, and it's just an interesting result. So despite the fact that the AIC value is worse, I would probably be interested in presenting this in a paper, and I did in my second year report. Um, basically, uh, when you look at this, um, earwig presence um, was um, negatively correlated with the likelihood of finding woolly apple aphid in conventional orchards but not in organic ones um, that's an interesting result again um, um, 
it would be tempting to interpret that as the earwigs are eating woolly apple aphid, and that's why I'm not finding woolly apple aphid in trees that have earwigs. Um, but this is only, uh, this doesn't give you that kind of information on causal relationships. It's just um, a sort of correlation between likelihoods. Um, so equally, it might be that in conventional orchards where they spray insecticides for woolly apple aphid, any tree that has woolly apple aphid on it um, tends to get sprayed with insecticide and it kills off all of the earwigs. Um, that would be another possible example of um, a possible interpretation of this effect. Um, similarly, another variable I looked at. So this is um, similar to model 25. Uh, so again, we've got the, uh, the survey when I went to the orchard. Uh, we have the farming system, whether it was organic or conventional, um, and this time rows per bed. Um, so they're less common now, but some um, apple growers uh, still plant um, multiple rows of trees within a single bed. Uh, it's a little bit more old fashioned, but it naturally it's going to change the um, the uh, microclimate for the insects and also probably has quite a big influence on the ability of those um, growers to uh, spray the trees that are in the middle of uh, other rows of trees because they're going to block the insecticide basically. Um, so this is this is again just an example uh, so I'm going to show this model um, where the ASC value is a lot better now um, so this is this is a big improvement over our previous model. Um, but this looks like something a little bit weird is going on. All of these are set to the p values are all set to the minimum value possible, um, which is a little bit odd. And if we go to this model here, where I try and include it now in the model alongside, um, organic or conventional and airway presence. Um, I'm getting this sort of error code. The model is failing to converge. I don't really know what this means, um, but basically I think this is because um, my uh, multi-row orchards that I had, I only had two orchards that had more than one row per bed and both of them were conventional. So I don't think it likes being in the same model. Um, but you can see how this is tricky to interpret because I've had, um, well, the AIC value has gone up here. I had a clear improvement here, um, but an error when I'm trying to include this variable in um, a more complicated model with other factors, which are also showing as significant. So, um, Hopefully that was really help, uh, helpful to some of you guys. Um, thank you very much for listening. Sorry if that was a bit uh, waffly at the end there. Uh, and yeah, that's what I wanted to share with you guys and talk about. Okay, thanks, Hayden. Let me just turn on the lights here so we have some light on the situation. Can I open up the floor for anybody that has a comment or a question to Hayden while I do that? Comments and questions. Um, no, I just want to say, like, it was a really good. Go on, oh, Eric, thank you. On, Eric. Thank you right. very much. And, and I, I completely relate with what. What my, what I presented like a, a couple of weeks ago, and I think I'm just um, kind of in between them um, when you are, because I'm exactly trying to work out those models. It was interesting to see how. I think you have 20 something because last week I was getting worried because I, I'm I'm around in the 10 iteration where I, I was like thinking is this too much or is this the way you're supposed to do it <laughs> like just testing one and, and one but it, it seems it is and looking at yeah the, yeah well a, actually a, um, the, the... sorry yeah sorry yeah, i was so going to say um understand what you are modeling ra rather than got up to, <laughs> got up to the 20s i actually went i actually think i ended up with uh 55 or 56 models in total that's probably that i think it was excessive 
in retrospect. Um, I was, <laughs> and Ed's nodding, yeah. Um, I um, got into a bit of a, um, a loop of just running through every possible iteration. It has to be said also, uh, we've looked at the models for predicting woolly apple aphid. I then had to repeat all of this uh, to try and model earwig presence as well. Um, so yeah, if you if you're getting into the tens of models, uh, I've been there, been there, and sailed past that a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> the other, the other, other types of the. I have put a question in the chat. How many observations overall there were? Um, perhaps it passed me. Um, yeah, so basically I had um, 10 trees in each orchard and 11 orchards. So that's um, 100 and, 110 trees in total. Um, and I observed each tree twice. So 220 observations, um, but with the caveat that those are paired, obviously. Um, yeah. You know, I'm just imagining how, uh, because that's uh, a limited number, limited with with all respect, you have done that uh, number of observations while you are trying to fit several factors uh, in the same model, and it leaves not so many observations into one subgroup of factors, which that's... can be a problem. But well, on the other hand, I understand. <laughs> yes yeah um definitely true um the basically it was just a, a huge amount of work um i'm sure you guys can appreciate anybody who does field work um it took uh typically um i maybe i maybe managed to survey two orchards um in a day so that's 20 20 trees uh which seems very slow but um driving out there walking through them uh finding the specific trees that i've selected um, and then counting every woolly Appalachian colony, um, shaking out earwigs from a trap um, and counting them, collecting those earwigs so that I can dissect them later. It um, basically, uh, yeah, I would love I would love to have uh, more data. Um, I think uh, the decision was kind of um, whether to look at a lot of trees in a small number of orchards or to try and look at a larger number of orchards that cover a kind of wider range of different possible factors. Um, and obviously what I've ended up with is a compromise. Um, and yeah, so I particularly, um, as as uh, hopefully I demonstrated with those last couple of models, when it came to stuff like the number of rows per bed, um, I do have very small um, numbers of observations per kind of factor level where um, there, there were only two orchards that had multiple rows per bed. Both of those were conventional. Both of those were owned by a single grower. So um, nesting of variables was um, a big issue to deal with. Um, and yeah, and the sample sizes as well, uh, which all just complements the model interpretation. Yes. Can I just Can add I just one, one, one more thing? One. I think I, you didn't mention this, but I saw in your code that at some point you were having some filters for I don't know if it's specific or charts or like like it seems you were like even cutting more your not cutting but like grouping more your your data I don't know if you talked about it or if you ha can say something about it and the reason I'm asking is because I was thinking exactly the same for my own experiment like just filtering by in my case it was treatment or things like that I I think I see something similar in, in, in your R code, but I don't, I don't know if that was the, the idea. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm not sure where you would have spotted that in this code. So um, I did do a small amount of filtering. I maybe scroll past. There was one point um, where um, to look at the multi row beds, um, like I said, all of my multi row beds were conventional orchards. Um, so I did run a test where I filtered out all of the the, the three organic orchards um, and looked mm. at multi row beds again um, to see uh, to see if it still held up as an important effect um, uh, without that in the model. Um, and that's uh, and it did. Um, so I think if you if you are worried about that kind of thing, it might be worth doing. 
um definitely so um testing testing a subset uh to kind of remove factors and um to make sure absolutely certain that your effect that you're getting for a particular one is significant um that was what i did there um yeah any other questions <laughs> So I'm only just reading chat. You did give me the good news first, Ed. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, Sarah. Hello. Thank you for that talk. Um, two questions, please. Um, is it possible to know the reference for that Harrison paper? Um, that seemed really yeah. good. That is, yeah, I really... Um, I am not a particularly statistically minded or mathematically minded person. So this paper was an absolute lifesaver. Um, and it also, um, it links several other papers. There we go, that's that's in the chat. It links several other um, really helpful resources. Um, so the, the data structure I didn't get until I followed a reference from Harrison et al that covers uh, baboons. Right. And um, yeah. And, and also, um, I did have to just pop out to speak to somebody. Are there any like main conclusions that you've drawn from doing this? It was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, so there were um, a couple of, I think the, the most interesting result, um, and sadly not one that is uh, without controversy, is that um, interaction effect um between um the farming system and earwig presence um which again you you get uh, both ways so modeling for woolly epilaphid and modeling for earwig presence you get a negative correlation between the presence of both insects apologies i'm rather ill um, um but um basically earwigs and woolly epilaphids are only uh, their presence or the likelihood of finding them is only negatively correlated with each other in the conventional orchards and not in the organic ones um, and that is a pretty interesting result and also um, pretty novel um, as far as i'm aware um, nobody's really uh, found an effect like that before um, and um, so the the most obvious sort of uh, spitballed conclusion or, or um, reason i could give for that is that the organic orchards contain um, vastly more woolly apple aphid than the conventional ones. Um, and so the um, earwigs there simply um, are not capable of making a big difference. Um, particularly when you bear in mind um, that once you simplify it to presence or absence, the question is not, are earwigs eating woolly apple aphid? It's are earwigs fully eliminating woolly apple aphid from a tree to the point where they're completely absent or I fail to detect them in my survey? Um, and that seems far less likely when um, there are uh, bordering on a thousand aphids in the tree as opposed to the maybe like 10, 15 that you can get find in a, in a conventional orchard. Um, uh, obviously, the uh, farming system itself uh, by itself is an important factor. Um, uh, that's not a big surprise for woolly apple aphid, where insecticide sprays are uh, uh, established as a control method. Um, what was interesting was um, finding um, a, a real lack of earwigs in the organic orchards that I looked at. Um, that's something that other papers haven't found in the past. Um, and on the face of it, there doesn't seem there's there's no obvious biological reason why an earwig would um, prefer an orchard that's sprayed with insecticides um, and dislike an orchard that is chock full of one of its known prey species. Um, uh, I um, I wonder I don't yeah and really I don't know what the um, what the explanation would be for that effect. One of the things that I considered was um, the amount of bare soil. So earwigs dig into the ground over winter um, and in the organic orchards, the, the um, tree beds 
um, had been covered in a sort of bark mulch that the earwigs potentially did not like um, digging into. Um, one of the things I looked at was um, moss and algae. Um, I did a qualitative assessment of how much moss and algae were on the different trees um, because they're both known to be uh, food sources for earwigs besides um, aphids. Um, and I, uh, I found a sort of marginally significant effect uh, for moss, but again, it was negative, which is the opposite of what I would expect. Um, yeah, those are those are the sort of main conclusions that I got from it. And yeah, the the most interesting by far is the interaction effect between farming system and air presence. I just um, I just have a couple of comments, Aiden. I've made a few uh, bullet points in my mind. Don't have any paper and pencil today. <laughs> One is that Harrison paper. I um, I do think that's a nice paper. I, I know uh, some of the authors and uh, the one of the middle authors, Cecily, came. Uh, she did her PhD with uh, her supervisors in Exeter on Dormouse, and she came down and spent up, I guess, and spent some time at in Manchester when I had a PhD student working on Dormice. And she gave us a draft of that paper to read before um, it was published. But it is a nice paper. It explains a really difficult concept. The um, mixed effects models and the difference between random and and fixed effects. But there's one thing that applies to your data set that you didn't mention. I can't recall if they go through it in the paper. You have to brace yourself when I say this, but um, variables can be either fixed or random effects, uh, and they can be both. And it, it, it probably is the case with some of your data that um, they could be either or or both. And you've probably thought of this, but that's a hard thing. There's another thing about your data set that's important to um, to uh, accept. And I think I think Eric or Jimek mentioned it, but in my own words, um, there uh, <clears throat> you have a certain number of observations, and uh, you you quite clearly explain that you're thinking about sampling across those different levels of your data set, right? And, uh, but we have to think one level deeper than that at least. And we have to think about sampling across different combinations of your factor levels. And for some combinations of your factor levels, you have, um, you know, no sampling and, and or very little sampling. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a definition of an unbalanced data set. And we just have to deal with that when we do. And um, you've dealt with it in a particular way. And I like the way, you know, you kind of took us on your journey of discovery here, um, both the way you analyzed it, discovering ways to analyze the data, but also the things you learned about your data. There is a thing that I wanted to say for you to think about. This is a thing for everybody to think about, but particularly you um, with this, is that um, when uh, when we use model selection, like you have with the AIC, um, we use we tend to use that. I mean, we tend to use it by we. I mean, anybody who has data would tend to use it in particular situations, and it, and it wouldn't be something we use all the time. So that's a thing that we, you know, we need to think about. The time when it's best applied. It's when we don't have any hypotheses about um, the variables we're analyzing. That's when it's the strongest. And because then uh, we treat every model as having equal likelihood. And the AIC made me flinch a little bit when you said there aren't any fast and hard rules for the AIC, because if we if we treat our set of models as having equal likelihood, there, there are hard and fast rules with it. Okay. Um, and the, those rules, you uh, what the AIC is, is in my words, this is my words, it's not a technical, um, it's a way I think about it, is that if there's some amount of variation that your model can explain, uh, the AIC is a quantification of the uh, leftover unexplained variation. The smaller it is, the better. But it's also penalized by the uh, 
by the complexity of your model. So the more terms in it, the higher the AIC is. So it's quite nice if we don't have, the, but the case that you have here, you do have some hypotheses about the data set and you ran into that um, failure to converge error. You, you guessed correctly that that's the reason it didn't converge because there wasn't enough sampling across all those levels of, um, that's when you get that. Mm -hmm. And you're in a you're in a particularly weird place. I sometimes have used this joke with um, a former general in the United States who um, said something to the effect, I'll paraphrase, and he said, "We you go to war with the army that you have, not the army you want to have." And um, the way I've bastardized that into a stats joke, a stats dad joke, is uh, we analyze the data we have not the data we wish we had. And <clears throat> for your data set, we, you have to, I think you'd be best to eventually conclude, you may not be at the end of this journey yet, you may need to think about it some more, but I think it would be best to think about um, what are the constraints for this analysis. And um, I probably would advise, um, considering the way you've used model building up to now as a learning process, but, um, but when you go to to publish this in whatever form that you'll publish it next, um, to spare the reader of of that journey and and just to focus on the one model that you think is true, um, and I, I sort of think that some of your variables um, are redundant to one another, either as fixed or random effect. Here's an example of one where I think that's true. That's that if there's if there's not examples of um, the practice between different growers, some growers are all organic or some growers are all conventional, then those two variables cancel each other out. They're equivalent to one another. OK, that's one simple example. Another one is um, if between growers or between orchards, there's no cross variation in the number of rows. Then that also cancels one another out. And uh, for the number of rows, um, that one you threw in at the end, uh, I would also think of certain variables like the number of rows. Now, we know that that might affect the density of trees, and that might have something to do biologically with um, the aphid transfer and the earwig um, populations. But if we have to go two steps to get to a, uh, a hypothesis about a variable, rather than just one step, for example, the presence of earwigs affects the presence of um, woolly aphids. If we have to go a second step, I, I would personally devalue one that we have to really think hard about and a devalue one, I guess I'm trying to say, for which you don't have good sampling across all the other levels of your variables. Mm. What I'm trying to tell you <laughs> is that um, I think you've got a, some good results in there somewhere but it's just very complicated. And I think that um, based on what you've learned now, the place where you are is you need to think about the one model. We shouldn't be using model selection for when we have hypotheses about, about ones. So that's all I have to say, really nice. I'm really glad to see this. I'm, I, it was, I was glad also to see the journey you've been on. <laughs> Thank you. Any final words? I thought it was great. Any final comments from anyone? Thanks so much, Hayden. That's OK. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And yeah, thank you for the feedback, Ed. Um, you sent the write-up of this stuff to me uh, at a time when I was um, flat out and I had no extra time to feedback, and that was a couple of weeks ago, and I'm just coming out of that. I know you've turned in your report now, but that feedback that I just said would have been the principal feedback is that we need to simplify down those results and make it make it a solution for the reader rather than a challenge for them. Yeah, it's a it's an ugly situation, I would say. We can talk about that outside of this meeting soon, if you wish. I'll, I'll talk to you later. Have a nice night. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good night, um, everyone. I'll see you next week. We have something on deck. Uh, we'll do the cheat sheet um, exercise, and um, I'll see you then. We're going to stay on here. I'm going to stop the video here. And uh, what 